You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. And welcome to this another edition of The Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs and I'm so thankful to be with you and so glad we have this opportunity to open up God's Word and to study together. We encourage you to get the Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study. Feel free to take any notes that you'd like as well as we look into the Bible, the Book of God, and study for a while. I'm so thankful that you've tuned in and so thankful for this occasion that brings us together. And I want to tell you something. I don't take those words lightly. I want you to understand something. And whenever I say I'm thankful to be here, I really mean that. I'm not just saying that. Those are not just words that we say at the beginning and end of a program. I really do mean it because this is a privilege and this is a, a, <clears throat> certainly an honor and a blessing that God has provided for me to have this opportunity to go and to just talk about God's Word, to study for a while in the truth of the Lord. It's a real blessing. Not a lot of people get to do this. And even in our country that has freedom and has liberty, uh, just because of the occasion and just because of the time constraints of folks and just because a lot of times the logistics of things, not everybody has this opportunity to be on television, to have this video, and it is a real blessing. I really appreciate this, and I'm glad that you've tuned in. I tell you what, I've heard from people uh, from all different places and they talk about the program, they talk about the, the study that's provided, and just open up God's Word, and it is a real blessing, it's a real treat to get to know you, and it's a real treat to get to talk to you, and I'm so glad that this program is doing uh, its intended good. And may God get the glory for everything, and may God be praised in all that we do, and that's why I say I'm thankful to be here, and I'm thankful for your tuning in. I want us to look in the book of Acts chapter 9 as we study about a case of conversion, specifically the case of the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Now, you're going to read about this in Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26. There's three chapters in the book of Acts that give us insight into the conversion and into what happened. The first one in Acts chapter 9 tells us kind of the overall story, if you will, the overall event, what happened and, and so forth, and, and who is involved and all of that. As you get into Acts chapter 22, we see more, uh, we, see, we see less of what happened on the Damascus Road and more about what was said there between uh, uh, Paul, that is Saul, okay, Saul of Tarsus, he becomes Apostle Paul, so if I say Saul and Paul interchangeably, you understand why. Uh, but here is Saul and Ananias and their conversation together. When you go to Acts chapter 26, though, Acts chapter 26 gives us insight into what Christ said to Saul on the road. And so whenever you look into those three passages, those three chapters, you're going to get insight into that one event, the event of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And so I think it'd be good for us to study that and look at that together and spend our time in a study of this conversion and see what lessons we can learn from this. Just by way of background, remember that Saul of Tarsus is really talked about back in Acts chapter 7. And when they, uh, the, that is the Sanhedrin goes to kill Stephen. Stephen was preaching the truth, the Jews didn't like it, and they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. The Bible says at that time that when that happened, they laid their clothes down or their outer garments, their coverings, and so forth, like coats and, and things like this. They laid those down at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now that's this Saul we're going to be reading about. And then they went, of course the idea was that everybody wanted to get a good shot at Stephen. And so, you know, if you have a coat on and things like this, your arms can be con restricted from really getting a good throw in. So they'd tear off their, their outer garment, they'd pull off their coats, and they'd pull off these outer garments and lay those down so their arms were free to really throw a rock. And that's what they were doing. They threw those rocks at him and killed him till he died. And that's what happened to Stephen. Saul was a witness to all those things. And we find that he, uh, in his life, uh, early part of his life here, 
would go, and the Bible says he compelled men to blaspheme. He would go and persecute Christians in strange cities. He would go and, and try to harm them and try to kill them and put them in prison, many things. He said, I thought within myself to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's what Saul said, or Paul said from his very mouth. I thought within myself to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And so after, this, after Stephen's death, you look in Acts chapter 8 and we say that, that Saul was consenting or he approved of this execution. He was consenting to the death of Stephen. And the Bible says that there was great persecution that arose against the church of Jerusalem. And the Bible says that, it, that the people, Acts 8 and verse 4, the disciples went everywhere. They were scattered abroad, first of all. They were scattered abroad and they went everywhere preaching the word. That's what they did. And now whenever you begin to read, you read about Saul breathing out threatenings and slaughters and so forth. As you go into Acts chapter 9, verse 1, he's still doing it. He is still busy. And so what we saw in the Acts, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8, first part of that chapter right there, what we saw there is still continuing on. Even though we kind of left him, we left Saul for a moment and we went and followed Philip and his preaching around. And now we come back to Saul. Now Saul's still breathing out threatening, slaughters, and wickedness, and all of that against God's people. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 9 here, in verse number 1, that he wanted to get letters. In verse number 2, that he wanted letters so that he could go to Damascus and have even more authority to get even more Christians and to, and to take them bound, it says, bound to Jerusalem. So what he's trying to do is basically a, a mass... Uh, where he can come in and take them and um, extricate them, if you will, and bring them all back now, back to Jerusalem, to stand trial, okay, and to, to answer for their wrong deeds, and to answer for betraying what, what Saul would consider a betrayal of God, to go after this Nazarene, this, this, this Jesus person. We don't, even, you know, we don't even know who he is, and he's dead now and everything, and they're still following him. And they're, they're going against our traditions of Moses and so forth. And so here Saul is, breathing out those threatening slaughters, wanting to put him in prison, bring them bound to Jerusalem, and all of that. That's what's going on here in Acts chapter 9. Now, as he went on his way, the Bible says, he approached Damascus, and there was a light from heaven that came and round about him, and he fell to the ground. And when he fell to the ground, he heard these words, saying, Saul, Saul... Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And he says, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And that, that's what is, is spoken here. Now, you say, Well, what does that mean? Saul, I mean, we understand, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And understand, whenever he says, Who art thou, Lord? He wasn't saying, I recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. What The word Lord there just means somebody that has power over me. Someone who is a ruler, someone who is sovereign or whatever. And so if you think about it, whenever Saul is, is there going on his way and he is knocked to the ground, see, and there he is and someone starts speaking to him with this light shining around about you that's blinded you, and there he is, it's blinded him, and there he is, I mean, he knows he's talking to a superior. Now, he might not know everything just yet, but he knows he's talking to a superior, and he says, who are you, Lord? Who art thou? And then comes the answer, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. I am Jesus, you are persecuting me. Which tells me something else about God's, God's people and God's church. You see, a lot of times folks put down the Lord's church and they say, you know, it's not important, it's not necessary, or whatever. If you're, you're guilty of that, folks, you need to quit that. If you've been guilty of saying that, if you've been guilty of be believing that, you need to quit that because the Lord's church is very important. When you look into the New Testament, Jesus says, I will build my church. Matthew 16, verse 18, he promises to build it. By Acts chapter 2, it is in existence because it came into existence in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, that was the day of Pentecost following Christ's crucifixion. Now, having said those things, when you read about the Lord's church, you don't read about it in dismissive terms, unimportant, unnecessary. You read in Acts 20 and verse 28 about how the church was purchased with the blood of Christ. 
Now, folks, if the church is purchased with the blood of Christ, that tells me it is important. It is very important. If I think about the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, the precious blood of Christ that was offered so as to purchase the church, that tells me how important it is. Number two, when we think about the Lord's church, we read about the church in a number of descriptions, descriptive phrases. One of them is the body of Christ. And when you talk about the body of Christ, you find that the church is the body and Christ is the head. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, Colossians 1 verse 24, speak about the Lord's body in this way. Also Ephesians 1 and verse 22 and 23. If you look over there in those passages, you're going to read that the church is the body of Christ and Christ is the head. Let me ask you something. Just what kind of importance do you place on your body? See that? If someone was, was hitting you, say, and someone was... Maybe they were hitting, maybe they were punching you in the, in, in, the, in the midsection, in the gut, and they just keep punching and punching and punching. And somebody says, leave him alone. Or maybe you try to say it, leave me alone. What would you think if someone said, this shouldn't be a problem for you, I'm only hitting you in your body, I'm not hitting you in the head. Would that make it okay if they said, if they excuse their, their punching you in the, in the, in the midsection, in the, in, the, in the stomach or wherever, and they keep punching and punching and they say, but I'm not hitting you in the head. I'm only hitting your body. Say, would you say, no, that's me. That's, that's all me here, <laughs> wouldn't you? You look at Christ. He says, you're persecuting me. That shows the relationship between saved people and Jesus Christ. Whenever you, you, whenever these folks, I'll start with them, whenever these folks from Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter 8 now, Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter 8, have heard God's word, they believed on Christ and repented of their sins. And they confessed their faith in Him like the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. And then, being baptized for the remission of their sins, they became Christians. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved, Acts 2.47, and because that's the case, when they became Christians, they're part of that body. They're part of this body we're talking about, this body called the church. The word church just means congregation. It just means assembly, and that's what it's about. And so here's a congregation, here's a group of people that belong to the Lord, and Jesus shows how close this connection is and how close this relationship is when he says to Saul, he says, why are you persecuting me? Think about it. So far as I know, so far as I can tell in Bible history, Saul never met Jesus. So far as I know, they never met one another. They, they have never seen one another until this day, Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus. This is the first time they've met. And yet Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And my, my point is this. We, can, we can't say that, that Saul somehow had a personal vendetta or a personal grudge personally against Jesus Christ. You can't say that. I don't know if they ever even met. But when you attack and when you persecute and when you try to harm the children of God, Jesus says, that's me. I take it personally. And he was not going to allow Paul or Saul at this point, not going to allow Saul to continue in this anymore. Why are you persecuting me? See that? Why are you doing it? This is the one body. Another description you have in the, in the New Testament concerning the church is the idea of a bride and in Jesus Christ being the groom. And you think about two married people, then a bride and a groom, okay? And so whenever you have the bride and groom and then they get married, what are they? Genesis 2 says and Matthew 19 says, the two become one flesh. And so whenever you do something to one person, you've actually done it to both of them. And he says, this is the idea, why are you doing this to me? Don't do this. We need to place high uh, regard, we need to place respect where it belongs, and, and there with the Lord's church. See? Because Jesus Christ died to purchase that church. 
he died and his blood was shed for the for the purchase price of that church, Acts 20, 28. And then those who are uh, Christians, those who become Christians through faith, repentance, and baptism are added to the church. And then they're a part of that church, that group, that congregation of people, that assembly. And then from, from that we see that special relationship that carries with them through, the, through their days, through their life. You remain faithful to him. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Isn't that wonderful? And you come back to the text. Saul saw why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. Now what does that mean? Hard for thee to kick against. Some, some versions say hard to kick against the goads. G-O-A-D-S. The goads. What is he talking about there? Well, what he's talking about is back in these days, there, uh, of course, you had oxen and you had, you know, the animals that would pull the plow, okay? They would pull together, or the idea was to get a yoke of oxen, they would pull together to plow the fields or to pull a wagon or whatever was necessary. They were these, you know, animals, this livestock that's used for a beast of burden. And so here they do their work. Well, sometimes you get an ox or you get, you know, a, an animal like that that didn't want to do. He didn't want to fall in line. He didn't want to, and, and of course, if you remember, the oxen are yoked together. So if one yoke, one oxen is acting up, you got another one affected as well, don't you? One of them's having problems and kicking and bucking and carrying on. Then the other one's going to try something too or might be harmed could be, you know, you can break your neck in one of those yokes. Not to mention you're trying to plow a field, say you're trying to plow a field with the oxen, not to mention that part of things. And the work that needs to be getting, needs to be done can't be done. So what they did was they invented what was called this gold. Or, and, and what it was was it was a long stick pointed on the end, very sharp on the end, and they'd lay that thing out there and they'd set it up, set it up by the... Uh, oxen by his legs and feet down there and whenever he wanted to kick what he would do he would kick and he'd kick against that sharp pointed thing that goad he would kick against it and it, of course it'd do harm to him it wouldn't necessarily hurt others but it'd hurt him and you know it's kind of like a lot of things you keep kicking at that goad long enough and you'll figure out every time you kick against it it hurts you it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt anybody else. It hurts you every time you kick it. And finally, if you're an ox or if you've you know, got that, that beast in there, whether it be an ox or a mule or whatever, but he kicks, he kicks against it enough times, he's going to quit or bleed to death because he keeps kicking against that sharp thing and hurting himself all the time. And he'll finally quit. Well, that's the idea. Whenever he says, Saul, Saul, it's hard for thee to kick against these goads. In other words... Evidently, the Lord has set before him something, and I don't know all the details, but evidently there's been things set before him, and he keeps kicking against it. He is a stubborn man, obviously here. He's stubborn. He's fighting against the Lord. He's fight, fought against him on every side, and certainly he has been very uh, malicious in trying to hurt and to harm and to you know, maim the people of God. So we know about that, and God says, and Christ says here, it's hard for you to do that. In other words, you ought to quit it. All you're doing is hurting yourself. See? And he goes on and he asks the question, Who art thou? He says, uh, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. He said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? That's a good question, isn't it? What will you have me to do? What is it that I can do? What is it that I can do to please you? What will you have me to do? It's obvious I'm not winning. It's obvious that I'm not doing what I should. What can I do? See that? Now, that's a good question to ask, isn't it? wonder if sometime, have you asked that question? Do you understand and do you not see that the Lord has... has wants you to do what he says. He has given us his word. He has given it in its, in its completion and in its fullness. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, St. Peter 1, 3 says. And knowing that he has given us all things, he's given us every word that's necessary. He's given us all instruction. He's ta taught us and shown us the way that is right and cannot be wrong. 
and how that we can be his child and how we can follow him and how we can be forgiven of sin. God has made that possible. He's made that as a reality. We can do this. We can live in a way that pleases the God of heaven and we can be forgiven of our sins. But I've got to quit being so stubborn. I've got to quit fighting against him. I've got to quit uh, putting up these barriers along the way and trying to keep the Lord out whenever he wants in our lives. He loves us and he wants to save us and he doesn't want anyone to perish. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, doesn't want anyone to perish but wants all to come to repentance and that includes you. And that includes me. So let's do that. Why are you doing this? Why don't you ask the question, Lord, what will you have me to do? What will you have me to do? That's the question that he asked there. Jesus said, Go into the city, and there to be told thee what thou must do. You need to go into the city, and you're going to find out what's necessary. See that? You think about that. This uh, just shows us once more that God in His wisdom, God in His providence, God in His foresight has said that when it comes to salvation and when it comes to teaching God's Word, God wants that done man to man. In other words, one human being teaching another human being. It's not that, and if you look in the New Testament, you'll see this over and over again. Jesus, it had been very easy for Jesus, right there. Lord, what will you have me to do? It's right there, easy for Jesus to say, well, you need to get up, you need to believe on me, repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be baptized. It had been very easy for Jesus to say that. It had been very easy. Go back to Acts chapter 8 and read about the angels and, and so forth, and the Spirit that was so concerned about making sure Philip and the Ethiopian met. And that Philip taught him. It had been very easy for an angel or the Spirit of God just to say, um, Excuse me, Mr. Eunuch, I need to tell you what to do to be saved. It had been very easy for, for an angel to do it or the Spirit, Holy Spirit to do it or whoever. See what I'm saying? But God chose that preaching be done. Be, it be done, that teaching be done man to man. And that's what this is about right here. Now that does not mean that there was not other instruction. Now that's where Acts 26 comes in because there were other things that Jesus said to Saul and things that he needed to remember, things that he needed to see this was going to be his work, this was going to be his duty and that kind of thing. We find it again in Acts chapter 26, you remember. And, and again, Acts chapter 26 and verse number 14, he said, Why are you persecuting me? It's hard for thee to kick against the goads. And so he says, Who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And he goes on and tells him this. He says, This is going to be your work. He says, I have appeared to you for this purpose. Acts chapter 26. Acts 26 and verse 16. And he begins, he says, I appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen. And he, and he says, Seen in me to those things which will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those that are sanctified by faith in me. And he goes on in this passage and feel free to read Acts 26 in its entirety and he says there to Agrippa I was not disobedient to this heavenly vision. But what I want us to see just for our purposes of our study is that where Acts 9 left off, Acts 26 comes in and Jesus had this to say as well. He said, I'm appointing you for a work. I've got things that you need to do. And you're going to be a witness for me to the Jews and for the Gentiles. And he says, I'm going to deliver you from the people. And I'm going to deliver you from the Gentiles, in fact. He says, in other words, you're going to need help and you're going to need deliverance. You're going to need rescuing from time to time because those people aren't going to want to hear what you have to say, but you need to say it anyways. And you need to speak out and you need to tell the truth. And that's what you're going to be doing, So He says, you're going to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light. And listen to this. From the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those that are sanctified by faith in me. That, that, I mean, that just stands out to me for many reasons, not the least of which is God says there's something called right and wrong and truth and error. 
We live in a society and in a time that says if you just as long as you're religious, if you have a religion or whatever, all is well and everything's okay. Not so according to God. He said, you've got to turn those people from darkness to light. You've got to turn those people from Satan back to me. And that's what he would definitely do. Well, let's go ahead and, and drive a peg right here. And we're going to go ahead and take a break here in just a moment. But we're going to come back on the other side of this break, continuing our study of Acts 9, 22, and 26, and the conversion of the Apostle Paul, and make more applications to our own lives. I'm so grateful for this time. You stay tuned, and we'll be right back in just a moment. You're watching The Ancient Landmark. We invite you to visit with the Caneyville Church of Christ, meeting at 101 North Main Street in Caneyville, Kentucky. Visit our website at www.caneyvillechurchofchrist.com Sunday morning Bible classes for all ages begin at 10 a.m. Sunday worship services begin at 10.45 a.m. and 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages begin at 7 p.m. And listen to our radio program, The Ancient Landmark, Monday through Friday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. on 106.3 FM WXMZ or listen to us live on the internet at www.thez.voyagetech.com. Write to the Ancient Landmark, care of Jared Jacobs, 5695 Caneyville Road, Morgantown, Kentucky, 42261. For a free Bible correspondence course and a free subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin, The Ancient Landmark airs on Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 1.30 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m., and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Our question at this time is asking about the word blasphemy. And specifically, what does that word mean? What does the word blasphemy mean? And as you look into the Bible, you see this term used quite often. You'll see it in the book, in the, in the gospel records, certainly, as it talks about blasphemy, blasphemy against Christ, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And uh, we see this on several occasions throughout the New Testament and Old Testament. What does that word blaspheme or blasphemy really mean? Well, blasphemy simply means to speak against something. And uh, often we talk about it from, obviously, the negative standpoint, to speak or to put down something. You're speaking against it. You're putting it down. You uh, do not regard it at highly at all. That's the idea when you're talking about blasphemy. And so, specifically, when the Lord talked about blaspheming uh, him... Uh, he talks about this when, when folks said in Matthew chapter 12, for example, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22, Jesus cast out a demon out of a man. And then the, the men there said, well, they, he did this by the power of the devil. He cast out devils by the power of the devil and not the power of God. And that's when Jesus talked about, uh, of course, can a demon you know, cast out himself? Can the devil cast out himself? And so forth. And so what he's trying to show is, no, my power is, is of God. It's not the devil's power. It is God's power. It is righteous. It is true. It is not evil in any way. And then he goes on and talks about blasphemy and how blasphemy would be forgiven. And he said, basically, you could, uh, at that time, they could have blasphemed Christ. He said, you can be forgiven for that. And again, they're speaking against him. They're putting Jesus down. They're considering Jesus as a devil himself. And so, obviously, if you, if you talk about God and you say that God is a devil, okay, and you say that God is, is Satan or whatever, that's blasphemy. You're speaking against. You're putting him down in that sense. 
You have low regard for the God of heaven. They had low regard, to put it mildly, a low regard for Christ. And so they blasphemed him. And of course, this continues on talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, whenever you put down the Holy Spirit, when you speak against the Holy Spirit, what you are really doing is you're speaking against his work. And if you remember, the Holy Spirit inspired these scriptures. And so Jesus says, if you, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, he said, there won't be any forgiveness. And people have made that into a, a, a larger uh, thing than perhaps it ought to be. Because he's not speaking of some kind of quote-unquote unforgivable sin that it didn't matter what you did, if you ever committed this, you can never be forgiven. No, because every sin that you repent of, you can be forgiven of. Okay? Any sin that you're forgiven of. I mean, consider this. In the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when those folks were, were uh, accused, and rightly so, accused of murdering Jesus, he still said you could be forgiven. And they could be forgiven if they repented and if they were baptized for the remission of sins. Now I want to ask you something. Is murdering Jesus somehow less, a lesser sin than blaspheming the Holy Spirit? I think not. They're both terrible, terrible sins. And so, you can be forgiven if you'll repent. But the point of Matthew 12, Mark chapter 3, uh, is the point that if you reject, see, if you speak against the Holy Spirit, you've rejected Him, you have put Him in low regard, He's, in, and he's not considered a high buff you at all, and you don't think very highly of Him at all, then... Uh, you're going to reject His Word. You're going to reject the truth that is revealed by the Holy Spirit. You're blaspheming in that case. You have rejected His Word in every way. And so there is no forgiveness because you won't submit yourself to the plan or the scheme of that redemption that was revealed by the Holy Spirit. You put Him down. See, that's really the point behind that. And so, but when we think about blaspheming, you can, you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you can blaspheme Christ, you can blaspheme God, and it means to put down, it means to hold in low regard, it means to speak against, and instead of loving God, instead of loving God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, instead of worshiping, instead of uh, praising See, you put down and you speak against and you discourage uh, folks from being Christians and whatever. And that's the idea behind blasphemy. And we need to avoid that. We need to stay away from it. Uh, we need to rather submit ourselves to the Lord, live for Him, have the forgiveness of sins through baptism, repentance and baptism, Acts 2.38, and then be, uh, look forward to heaven one day when this life is over. And we're back again, and we want to continue in our study of the book of God. We've been studying, obviously, from the book of Acts chapter 9 and 22 and 26, uh, talking about the case of conversion with the Apostle Paul. And we left off looking in Acts chapter 26 and talking about the words of Christ to this man, Saul. He was called Saul of Tarsus first, and then later on took the name of Paul about Acts chapter 13. But here in the beginnings, he was called Saul. And so that's why Jesus would say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he talks about it's hard for you to kick against the goats. And we talked about that. But there on that road to Damascus, he also said, Saul, you have responsibility. You need to turn people from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. Now here again, we left off talking about this because here is, a, is an occasion where we see how God has drawn a line. See, he's going to the Jews, the Jewish people. They were religious people. And we live in a time today where you say, people say, well, if they're religious and they have a religion, then everything's okay. Just choose a religion, you'll be all right. The Gentile people had religion as well. They oftentimes were idolaters, but it was a religion nonetheless. And again, if you apply that same logic, it says, well, they're religious people, so I guess they're okay. But no, God doesn't say that. God doesn't say, well, if you're, religion, if you're a religious person, you're okay. What he said is, you need to be following me. God had uh, recognized what a lot of folks today do not recognize, and that is there has been a change in the covenant. 
The old covenant of the Old Testament has been done away. It's been abolished. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 to 17 says so. It's been done away, abolished. It's been put away. And now, through Christ, because, Hebrews 9, 15, because of the shedding of his blood and because of the death of the testator, that is Jesus, now there is, of course, a New Testament. And in that New Testament, men, if they're going to be saved, must believe on Christ, must repent of their sins, confess their faith in Him, and be baptized. You have to do that. That's it. And what we're seeing here consistently, we can see this in the book of Acts, just consistently, anyone who became a Christian followed that pattern. And if they didn't follow that pattern, they weren't a Christian. If you follow that pattern, you were saved. If you don't follow that pattern, you're not saved. If you do follow that pattern, you're in the church. And if you don't follow that pattern, you're not in the church. If you do follow that pattern, see, you're, in, you're with God and, and you're sanctified with Him and, and so forth. But if you don't, you're with Satan. That's what this passage is showing us. You've got to turn people from darkness to light. If you do what He says and you do follow His pattern of, of salvation, faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, you'll be in the light. If you don't follow that pattern, you're going to be in darkness. See that? That's what we're seeing here. Now, uh, it doesn't give me any pleasure to tell people you're in darkness. But folks, I don't know how else, to, how else to warn you. I don't know how else to tell you except just say what the Bible says. And right here it is. In the book of Acts chapter 26, and beginning there in verse 18, you read about this, how he says, Saul, that's going to be your job. And that's exactly what he did. He said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Well, turn back to Acts chapter 9. Like I said, Acts chapter 9 kind of gives you the overall view of the whole situation and the whole event. Acts 26, Acts 22 give you some of the uh, finer points and that kind of thing. And so we come back to the big picture again. The Bible says that, that he was told to go and he said, uh, go into Damascus it will be told thee what thou must do. See, Acts 26, he just said, I wasn't disobedient. No, he wasn't. Now, what was he told to do? He was told, first of all, to go to Damascus. Go on into the city, and there will be told thee what thou must do. Again, man teaching man. We talked about that already. Well, he goes in, and he said, Now, the men that are traveling with me, he said, they were speechless. Acts 9, verse 7. They were speechless. They said they heard a voice, but they didn't see anybody. See that? And he said, so Saul rose from the ground. He gets up. And his eyes, he said, even though his eyes were open, he saw nothing. He was blinded. He was blinded. He can't see anything. So they had to lead him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. They had to lead him by the hand now. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, he, Jesus was there and and, uh, you know, he sees Jesus on the road, the bright light, and so forth, and he falls to the ground. I've heard people say uh, he fell off his horse. Have you ever heard people say that? They say he fell off his horse. Well, if he did fall off his horse, uh, I haven't seen it yet. And if it is, I've, I've read Acts chapter 9 and never seen anything as big as a horse in there. If you look there, and not only this, it says they took him and led him by the hand and brought him into Egypt. I'm sorry, brought him into Damascus. It brought him into Damascus. Now, my question would be this. If they're leading him, why didn't they just put him back on the horse? <laughs> if he's riding a horse, see, I mean, the horse is not blind, if there was a horse. I know those people, those other men are not blind. Saul's blind. Those other men are not blind. Think about that. So, if Saul's blind, and he's the only one blind... Why didn't they just set him, if he has a horse, why didn't they just set him back up on the horse and just, you know, tow the horse into town? No, they led him by the hand, folks. He's walking. But whatever. I mean, that's, that's ultimately, that, I suppose that's inconsequential, but it's always struck me when people talk about Saul falling off a horse, and I'm going, well, if he fell off a horse, why are they leading him by the hand later? See, would you put him back on the horse and ride into town? No. Uh, anyways, he was being led by the hand. He was walking, and they were too. Now, it says he was for three days and nights without sight, and did not eat or drink. Now, verse 10, there was a disciple there named Damascus, uh, in Damascus, and his name was Ananias. Now, Ananias sees a vision of the Lord, and he says, Ananias, he said, Here I am, Lord. 
Rise and go to the street, he said, called Straight, and to the house of Judas, and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. He said, For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in vision a man named Ananias come in. Uh, he says, And lay his hands on him that he might again, or that he might regain his sight. Now, he, here is Ananias who sees a vision. Ananias sees a vision, and the Lord says, You need to go find this Saul. And by the way, he's seen a vision, and he said he saw a vision where you came to the house. He says, You need to get over there and get in the house. So he see, and so that the vision, of course, will come true. But notice what Ananias said. Lord, here's Ananias' answer. Lord, I have heard from many about this man. See, Saul was not Mr. Nobody. He was somebody. He was well known. He was well, uh, I mean, well regarded by, obviously by the Jews. He'd been real, well regarded. He was greatly to be feared by the Christians. And he said, I've heard about this and how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. That tells me where he's been hearing the word. He's been hearing it from other Christians. How much evil he has done to the saints of Jerusalem. And here he has authority. Here, see, here, not down there, here, here in this town. I know he's done evil in Jerusalem, and I know that here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call upon your name. He said, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, I'm, you know, I just don't think this is the way to go because uh, he knows, I know that he has authority here. And he sees a vision me coming to him. He can get me and put me in prison and all kinds of things. And I didn't think it's a good idea at all. Now, the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Kind of like what we read in Acts 26 that Christ said specifically to Saul. Now Ananias is hearing about this. He's my chosen vessel and he has work to do. You go on and go. You go and take care of him. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias departed. And we'll, we'll look at more into that here in just a moment. But think about this. Here we see a man by the name of Ananias. He is someone who uh, was, and we're going to read about him in Acts chapter 22, he was somebody who was well respected by the community and things like this. He was, he was somebody that was in Acts 22 and verse 12, it says, one Ananias, a devout man according to the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who live there. So here's a man who he is well spoken of. And that's why I wanted to add Acts chapter 22 to this. Because in Acts chapter 22, we read about Ananias and we read a little more about his character. He's a devout man. The idea of devout is the idea, we, oftentimes we use the word devoted. He's a devoted person. He is a devout person. He's a religiously minded person, a spiritual person. This is Ananias. And this is where the way that he is. And he is well regarded. He was well regarded by the Jews and others in that, that place. And so he is well known in that town. And so just like we said, Saul is a somebody. Ananias is a somebody also. He's not a nobody. You talk about Ananias in the city of Damascus in the first century, and people know who you're talking about. And they know what kind of man he is, and they have respect for him. And so here is a devoted man, and he is to go, and he is to speak to Saul. Now in Acts chapter 9, we'll go back to Acts chapter 9 for a moment. Acts chapter 9, then, he's, it's when Ananias has his vision, and he's saying to God, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think I need to be going into this. Which shows me the power that God has given to each one of us and it's called free moral agency. Free moral agency. Uh, it's the idea that you have the ability to choose. You can choose to do right, you can choose to do wrong. You can choose to be good or you can choose to be evil. Now, there are consequences both ways. Don't misunderstand. 
It's not that you make a choice that's free from consequences. No, there are consequences, and God lets us know what they are in the Bible. But at the same time, you have a choice. Just like Adam and Eve had a choice in Genesis chapter 3, just like Cain had a choice in Genesis 4, he didn't have to kill his brother, he chose to kill his brother. He didn't have to be jealous, he chose to be jealous. Just like Noah had a choice, he didn't have to build the ark, he chose to build the ark. And well done that he did. He made the right choice, he was not forced. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, Moses didn't have to do this. He was chosen, and he did choose to do what, he, what God said, and Hebrews 11 says so. Choosing, Hebrews 11, 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And so make no mistake, he had a choice. Moses had a choice. Joshua had a choice. Go down the line, David had a choice, and, and the, the prophets, and so forth. And then you come on down, here is Saul. Saul had a choice. And yes, he was blinded, but he still had choices all along the way. And he could choose to be a Christian, or did he, he didn't have to be a Christian. Or, once he became a Christian, he didn't have to be faithful to God. He could have done something else. He could have been like, uh, Demas, couldn't he? He could have been like a lot of folks who were who turned against God, who were evil and and and, and turned their backs against God. They could have he could have done that. He could have done that. And Ananias didn't have to go. And you hear him in the beginning of Acts chapter nine saying, "Listen, I've heard all kinds of evil about that man. I am not interested." That's his point. I am not interested. You know, he has power in this city to bind people and put them in prison. And, you know, you think about that. I don't want to be near that. I don't want to be near someone like that. There's no telling what he might do. He may very well do it. He may very well put me in prison. See that? Ruth had a choice to make. Hannah had a choice to make. Esther had a choice to make. See, all the apostles had, had a choice to make. You have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. Will you make the right one or not? Will you make the right choice and serve the Lord? Will you do what the Lord has said to do? Or will you turn against Him? Will you accept the responsibility of being in Christ and fulfilling His word and His will? Or will you just listen to what men have to say? Will you turn your back on God? Will you just not listen to Him and just live as you please? That's a choice. See that? That's a choice each and every one of us have. I pray you'll make the right choice and serve God. You look here and we find Ananias. Even though he said this, God said, you need to go. He's a chosen vessel for me and I'm going to show him all the things he's going to suffer for my name, but you go to him. And sure enough, in verse, Acts chapter 9 and verse 17, Ananias departed and he entered the house. He entered the Judas's house. You remember Judas lived on Straight Street. And so he goes over to Judas' house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared to you on the road, uh, who appeared to you on the road by which you've come, has sent me to you, that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, not later on down the line, not two weeks later, not a month later, not three years later, immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. He regained it. And then the Bible says something else happened. I want you to stop right there and think for a moment. What has he done? He went and, and Ananias was obedient. He was obedient. You remember when Saul said, I was not disobedient, King Agrippa, Acts 26. I was not disobedient. No, he was obedient. That's what that means then, isn't it? He was obedient. Ananias was obedient. And when both men were obedient and both the preacher and the sinner got together, now you can have salvation. Go back to Acts 22. In Acts chapter 22, then, we again read about Ananias. And like I said, we're just piecing these things together from Acts 9, 22, 26. You go back to Acts chapter 22. 
And you find that Ananias said, again, he came to me. This is verse 13 of Acts 22. Came to me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And that very hour he said, my si uh, I received my sight and I saw him. He received a sight and he saw him. I had my sight back. It wasn't, like I said, it wasn't three weeks later, two months later, five years later. Immediately, immediately the scales fell. Immediately he saw and he saw clearly. That's a miracle. And now it says, here's what he says. Uh, the God of, of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear the voice uh, from his mouth. For you will be a witness to him, to everyone, he says, and what you have seen and heard. So even Ananias was speaking about this. You're going to be a witness to this, to all you've seen and heard. And it's fascinating, all you've seen and heard. It's fascinating every time the Apostle Paul stands in trial. And that's later on in the book of Acts, toward the end of the book of Acts. Every time he stands on trial, you'll see him tell this same account. And he'll tell about how he was converted to the Lord. See, you're going to give a witness to this, to everything you've seen and heard. Now, why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And the Bible says that he did that very thing. Acts chapter 9. Go back to Acts chapter 9 now. I know we're flipping back and forth. But Acts chapter 9, he says that he was, he was baptized. He arose and he was baptized. Verse 19, and he took food and he was strengthened. So now he arose and he's baptized. Now why are you waiting? Why tarry thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Somebody says, well, there's that baptism again. Yeah, there it is. But you know he wasn't saved by baptism alone. It wasn't baptism alone. For you remember, he says, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. Lord, what will thou have me to do? Whenever he knows it's Jesus, he says, What do you want me to do? This man believes on Christ. A man who didn't believe on Christ before now does believe on Christ. He said, go into the city and be told thee what thou must do. He went into the city and it says he spent three days and nights in fasting and prayer. Three days and nights in fasting and prayer. Folks, right there is your repentance. And after, being, after his faith and now his repentance, three days and nights in fasting and prayer, now the man comes, Ananias comes and says, rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. See that? Now that's the truth. And here is the Apostle Paul. Or I'm sorry, here is Saul of Tarsus. He will be the Apostle Paul, but here is the Saul of Tarsus. And what does he do? He does exactly what the Lord said to do in order to be saved from sin. He does it. He follows that. He follows the Lord's plan and pattern. He follows that uh, just as being taught. Now think about that. Here's your faith, repentance, and baptism yet again. And we can't get around that, folks. You can't deny that. We can't deny that those things didn't happen or those things are not true because they went on. And here's a man who followed just what they were told to do back in the book of Acts chapter 2 is follow what they were told to do in Acts chapter 8 and now in Acts chapter 9 and 22 and 26. 9, 9 and 22 both specifically speak of baptism. Acts chapter 26, he says, I was not disobedient. Well, of course he wasn't disobedient. He did what the Lord said to do. See, And so there he is. Now, when it comes to this uh, baptism, see, people will deny it, won't they? Perhaps this evening I'm talking about this. You might be sitting there going, no, 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 that's not what happened. It didn't happen. He was saved when he was on the road to Damascus and he called upon the Lord. And he was saved right then. Whenever he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And he was saved then. If you think he was saved then, my question is this. If you think he was saved then, why say later on in Acts 22, 16, which corresponds to Acts 9, and 17, and 18, why say wash away your sins then? According to the position that says that Saul was saved on the road to Damascus, his sins were already washed away all the way back then some three days earlier. Why is he saying, now wash away thy sins? See, if Saul was saved on the road to Damascus, I want to tell you something. If Saul was saved on the road to Damascus, then Saul didn't know it. Saul didn't know it. 
Because Saul said, what will you have me to do? Think about that. He's wanting to know what to do to be saved. What do you have me to do? If he's a saved person, he didn't know it. If he's a saved person, Jesus didn't know it. Because Jesus said, go into the city and it'll be told what you must do. See that? If he's a saved person, he didn't know it. And if he's a saved person, Jesus didn't know it. See, me like Jesus knows everything. And why didn't he know that uh, he was saved? Why didn't he just say, go, do, do for what? <laughs> See, do for what? Well, you're already saved. Don't worry about it. That's not what happened, was it? So if he is saved on the road to Damascus, Saul didn't know it, Jesus didn't know it. i tell you something else. Ananias didn't know it because Ananias went to his house and told him what to do to be saved. Why are you waiting? Rise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins. Say, call on the name of the Lord. Ananias didn't know it. And nor did Ananias not know it. Luke didn't know it. Think about that. See, the writer of the book of Acts is Luke. Okay, just like the Gospel of Luke. Okay, then he wrote the book of Acts also. And so Luke didn't know it because Luke didn't write that he was saved on the road to Damascus. He just wrote the things we've read already. And number five, if Saul is saved on the road to Damascus, the Holy Spirit didn't know it. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired Luke to write what he did. Think about that. So, see what happened? If he's saved on the road to Damascus, the Holy Spirit doesn't know it because he didn't tell Luke to write it. Luke didn't know it because he, he didn't write it. And then Jesus didn't, uh, you know, Jesus didn't know about it. And uh, Saul didn't know about it. Think about that. Ananias didn't know about it. So how did these men today figure out that Saul was saved on the road to Damascus when at least five people and, and five who were there didn't know it? But people know about it now? Wait a minute, what's that about? Oh no. He said, Rise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And that's what we need to do today, see? We need to do that same thing. And whenever you believe on Christ, you repent of your sins, you arise and be baptized to wash away your sins, Acts twenty two sixteen. Then you call on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord is the result of following that plan of salvation and not just saying, Lord, save me. That's not calling on the name of the Lord. You call on the name of the Lord when you do what He says and when you live for Him. And folks, you need to do that. If you haven't done it already, what's keeping you back? Can I help you in that in any way? Could we discuss this? Could we study this together? Just follow the same pattern or plan in accordance with the case of conversion. Just follow the same pattern here that Saul did. What's keeping you from it? What's stopping you? What excuses could we make for not doing what the Lord says? Don't be like that. But rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If I can help you in any way, I want to do it. You can contact me. We can talk about this. Call me. Write me an email. However you'd like. We've given you the information. And we'd love for you to come and be with us. If you're close by in the area, we'd love for you to come visit with the Caneyville Church of Christ. And if you can uh, write to us or, or call us, we'd love to hear from you. We're so glad for this opportunity. And so glad that you've tuned in. I hope you'll consider this seriously. Make your life right with God. And if I can help you in any way, I want to do that. Let's make sure that we're pleased in the sight of God to serve and to live for Him all the days of our life. I'm so thankful for this time and so thankful for our study together and so thankful for this opportunity. Until next time then, Lord willing, we bid you good day. You've been watching The Ancient Landmark. Tune in weekly on Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday, 1.30 p.m., Wednesday, 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m. or Friday at 9.30 a.m. Write to the Ancient Landmark, care of Jared Jacobs, 5695 Caneyville Road, Morgantown, Kentucky, 42261.